Hi everyone, I hope you're enjoying the session and having so much to learn on this last day of set of the map 2021. I'm Sharon Omoja and I'm joining from Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, the session that you're going to now is uh, a new map renderer for OSM, Rasters, Vectors, Language and Internalization by Brandon Leo. Uh, note that the duration for the talk is 20 minutes, that includes the Q&A session and remember to leave questions for the speaker on the q and a section thank you and enjoy the talk hello everyone i'm brandon i'm here to talk about a new map renderer for osm rasters vectors languages and internationalization so to frame my talk um, i'm going to go back to the sort of motivation for OpenStreetMap, which is it's a map of the world created by people like and free to use under an open license. So just to dig into what we think a map of the world is, um, most of us understand that it's a geometry data set. Um, so if you go onto openstreetmap.org, you can look up a place like London and you'll see a shape made of nodes, made of ways, made of polygons, for example. But I think one thing that's missed is that OpenStreetMap is also a language project. Um, it has tons and tons of language data, not only in the languages um, that are official, but also alternate languages. Um, for example, London on the left side has its name translated or transliterated into other languages of the world. And that's not just in tags. It's also very commonly used for map labels. So if you're rendering a map, whether that's on the web, on a device, um, a map renderer will take that tag information and turn it into textual labels. So OpenStreetMap is as much about language as it is geometry because a major mainstream use case is to display labeled features on a map. And this sort of goes back to the unique idea behind OpenStreetMap, which is about local knowledge and what people call a place. For example, um, in this example of the Chinatown in New York City, there is official and verifiable on the ground names in both Chinese and English for streets. That also applies to POIs. If you see this McDonald's, it has all of its signage actually in Chinese. So it's not only in places in Europe and Asia that have these, these multilingual tags, um, they're in the US too. And I think it's a really unique aspect of OSM because there's not a lot of people that believe that this data is of great commercial value, but I think in a lot of cases it has historical or cultural significance. And as OSM matures, its language data uniquely differentiates it from the major commercial map uh, sort of platforms like Google, like Apple, or Baidu. So for comparison, I know OpenStreetMap gets compared to Wikipedia a lot, but for Wikipedia, it takes a very different approach where each language is siloed off from each other. So there is a English Wikipedia, there's a Spanish Wikipedia, there's a Japanese Wikipedia, and those are all totally separate. On the other hand, for OpenStreetMap, because it combines all languages into one unified data set, this problem of showing text in different languages or multiple languages is a unique challenge. So what's the state of multilingual web maps made with OSM? Well, for the base layer on osm.org, which is called OSM Cardo, it doesn't really tackle this problem directly. It uses the name tag, which is by convention, the major official language in each country. So you can see here in this OSM Cardo screenshot of East and Southeast Asia, there's multiple scripts or multiple languages going on at the same time. Now you can fork OSM Cardo and you can change the MapNIC XML style sheets to use, for example, Korean names everywhere. But that's still, you know, like a lot of work to do. There's another project which is Wikimedia Maps, 
And a few years ago, they added support for multilingual rendering, so you can specify via a query parameter which language code you want the map labels to appear in. So here's um, a quick example of New York City in default English, and switching to Chinese will will replace those labels that have Chinese data with that text. Spanish, for example. So this raster map approach that's used in OSM Cardo and also Wikipedia is quite good for this use case of showing languages. Um, it uses the MapNIC text rendering stack. It uses HarfBuzz, which is a text shaping engine. It uses the Noto fonts, which are very complete across a wide range of Unicode. And it also has a Unifont fallback. And this is really the state of the art in free and open source text rendering. But there's a lot of drawbacks to this raster tile approach. For example, if you want to zoom in past about zoom 15, you'll quickly get to having billions of tiles to render. So pre-rendering becomes unfeasible. Now, the only way to get acceptable performance then is to have all the tile rendering on demand and cache it very aggressively. Um, but for a lot of devices that have high retina displays or high DPI displays, um, those will need to be rendered separately, which is a cache miss. And in the cases we're talking about where you're rendering in different languages, like Chinese or Spanish or Korean, for example, each additional language or combination of language, like if you had two languages on the map, those will also be cache misses. So it quickly becomes very taxing on resources to render different variants of raster tiles for every single language. In conclusion, server-side raster images are a viable approach for multilingual OSM rendering. But due to the resources it takes, it's very hard to commoditize. So I know what people will say now, which is vector tiles. Vector tiles, uh, they imply there is some client-side rasterization uh, maybe happening in the web browser. And in theory, this is the holy grail of multilingual OSM because you just send one tile for all languages and then you write a little bit of style sheets or JavaScript to be able to specify which language you want. So in this case, there's some streets in New York City that are in English. And then just by changing you know, some JSON, I switch those to Chinese. And in theory, this is the perfect solution. But there is some caveats here. Um, for example, people might, uh, might be wondering, why doesn't OSM.org use vector tiles? Well, for one, the status quo seems to be for commercial vendors or projects outside of OSM to create vector tiles. Um, the goal of OSM Cardo, from my understanding, is to show as much data as possible. And if the, this were to be translated into a vector tile world, that would involve lots of decision making as to which features are generalized and which ones appear or disappear at a given zoom level. So for OSM Cardo, it shows a very dense representation of this part of London. And in fact, raster tiles are a very kind of efficient and compressed way to show all of these different features. But even if vector tiles were a solved problem, a mapping system is not complete without a renderer. And this is the part that I mostly want to focus on because I think there is some interesting caveats that I want to go into. Um, I'd say the de facto standard for vector tiles on the web is Mapbox GLJS version one. Um, it's ubiquitous now. It's used by other commercial systems such as Esri and Microsoft Azure. It's under a very generous BSD license and it's become sort of a, a low level layer in a lot of open source projects. Uh, there's sort of an ecosystem built around Mapbox GLJS version one. And some of the features for Mapbox GL, which I'm going to display in a browser, are it has this really nice scaling of text. So this is a very exaggerated example, but when I zoom in and out on New York, you can see that the text will scale continuously from small to large. Um, 
And what's interesting about that is that sort of behind the scenes, it uses sign distance fields to achieve that. So all of the resizing is done inside of a GPU shader. And this is what, you know, the Glyph Atlas looks like under the hood. But in my experience, this approach to rendering text has some drawbacks for internationalization. For one, any uh, sort of writing system that has much more detailed glyphs, such as Chinese, is going to look quite different. So in this example, I'm also scaling text in the same way, but you can see as text gets large, it looks a little bit degraded because sign distance fields in the previous example are not good at showing sharp corners. Um, I think I did read that in Mapbox GL version two, there is some improvements to this, but I'm not sure if those will ever make it to the version one code. Now there's other instances uh, such as for Burmese, uh, the writing system, Mapbox GL actually cannot do any kind of complex text layout um, because in general it has a one code point to one glyph approach. Um, so on the right is OSM Cardo, on the left is how Mapbox GL shows it right now. Um, and this would require implementing a couple more features in Mapbox GL version one to display Burmese text correctly. Like another example is Tamil. Um, in this case, uh, it's Singapore rendered in Tamil, which OSM has some information, but on the right and on the bottom is how the browser renders it. And on the left is how Mapbox GL version one renders it. Um, so that's not sufficient um, if you want to make a map that's all rendered in Tamil. And this is not to say that the designers of Mapbox GL were ignorant or it's a bug or something. It's just that um, it prioritizes it, prior, it prioritizes performance over these other aspects. And that's a trade-off they make, um, most likely because the user base for a commercial mapping platform is likely mostly concentrated in North America and Western Europe, where uh, things like rendering Burmese correctly are not important. And all text uh, technology has to make some kind of trade-off. If you think about, for example, um, a uh, like an LED signage system to show Chinese, uh, you'll have to simplify your characters a lot just to fit them into a grid. Um, so this uh, concept of text on the web is no different. Um, but it's really a question of who is the user? And I think for a commercial mapping platform, like one that is targeted by Microsoft or Mapbox or Google, they might be more worried about their users uh, having good performance in North America and Western Europe. But for a project with a global scope like OpenStreetMap, it's very important that you know, this part of the world in red, yellow, and orange is well covered. So for rendering overall, the status quo best renderer that is the most popular for vector tiles is not sufficient for the global map use case. Um, there is some solutions, at least for the web, such as using the Canvas API or the DOM, because in, this, in those cases, the browsers have done a lot of work to do internationalized text correctly. So the browser Canvas API will do complex text layout, for example, but you might have some trade-offs in terms of performance. For example, Tangram.js, which is another vector tile map renderer, um, uses the Canvas API. Um, I'll just give a quick demo of how that works right now. So Tangram.js um, does not have that same sort of smooth uh, scaling of text. Instead, text will simply reflow at different zoom levels. And like I said, for localization, you can simply change the label language here and it will change to that language on the client side where it has the data in OpenStreetMap. Now I'm also working on an even simpler map renderer called ProtoMaps.js. 
Um, it uses some of the same ideas like Tangram for Canvas text, uh, which supports um, many more languages. And uh, the goals behind it are it's single threaded, it's less than 20 kilobytes right now gzipped, and it uses pure Canvas without WebGL. Um, and this works directly as a leaflet tile layer. It is, however, very early stage and incomplete. It's on GitHub, it's open source. I'll give a quick demo of how that works right now. So in this example, this is protomaps.js rendering type A, and you can see that this text simply works like your old fashioned leaflet map. Uh, there is no continuous zoom uh, smoothly between different zoom levels. It's kind of snaps between each one. Um, but at each zoom level, it will render all of the text using the Canvas API, which does do shaping for languages such as Tamil, Burmese, and other uh, sort of South Asian and Southeast Asian scripts. It also has pretty high quality text rendering for Chinese script. Now, like I said, this is all on GitHub uh, under the protomaps org, protomaps.js. So in conclusion, I guess my message here is that rendering OSM, even if you have vector tiles on the back end, is still far from a solved problem, especially in the global use case and addressing a worldwide audience uh, with you know, all worldwide writing systems. So we ought to, ex to explore different trade-offs for label rendering on maps. And I think for the reasons I mentioned early on, New approaches to rendering are essential to the future of the OpenStreetMap in order to show off all the great multilingual information that is inside of OpenStreetMap already. So ProtoMaps.js is my personal attempt at a vector renderer. It's still uh, quite bare bones. There's a lot of improvement to do with things like uh, smart label layout and uh, line labeling, for example. Um, but there's plenty of room to build your own. Um, if you're inspired by this talk and you want to um, start, start writing your own vector tile renderer, um, I'd be happy to uh, brainstorm with you. You can find me at beatdown on GitHub, Twitter, or you can email me at brandon at protomaps.com. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for the amazing talk and great insights on vector, vector tiles for OpenStreetMap. I will jump into the questions section and we have quite a number of questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, people won't use OSM in places, um, in places where the text does not get, does not get rendered nicely, uh, which attracts less developers who will have the knowledge to make the text render nicely. Okay. Um... Are you able to hear me okay? Um, I think this sort of ties into a lot of the conversations within OSM about um, sort of making it a globally scoped project. Um, and I think one aspect of that is to make sure there's not an artificial boundary um, that would exclude certain languages or writing systems from you know, being first class citizens inside of OSM. Um, so I think that while it's true that a lot of um, these language communities um, are, are not yet on OSM. I think it's important that we think about um, these technical aspects to make sure that it's eventually going to be possible um, to support those. Oh, great. Uh, the next question is, uh, how accurate are translations in the platform you presented? Uh, do they specialize in specific languages or do they have accurate translation in certain languages than other languages? Um, all of the information that I showed is in OSM already. Um, in my experience, um, a lot of there's a lot of formatting issues because um, the fact that showing multilingual text is hard. So um, because like the main consumption point for a lot of OSM is web maps, um, and because it's been so hard to surface that information, um, I think there's not been a lot of attention. There might be errors. So part of my motivation is to be able to expose more of this great information so we can make the quality of translation or transliteration better. Okay. 
Uh, that's well understood. Our next question is: uh, Will ProtoMaps JS only work in web browser, or will it be possible to generate raster images on a server? It's focused only on the web. Um, it's technically possible to um, run this web code through Node headlessly um, on a server, but I think. Um, the MapNIC approach, which uses sort of the best-in-class libraries such as HarfBuzz, is uh, superior technically. Um, right now, I'm focused only on the web browser. OK, great. Uh, our next question is, uh, could MapLibre integrate ProtoMaps for labels of uh, complex scripts? Um, I think it's an interesting question. Um, it has a lot to do with what is the direction of um, projects like MapLibre or forks of MapboxGL as open source projects. Um, from my understanding, there's a lot of design choices and user experience choices, such as um, labels um, that can scale smoothly or labels on curved paths. That would be very hard to change the entire implementation of text. Um, so I would look more at um, renderers such as Tangram um, or ProtoMaps.js or open layers because um, text is such a fundamental technical challenge that it, your, um, your renderer has to be sort of based completely around your design. Thank you for that. That's well elaborated. Uh, there is another question on uh, what's your weapon of choice to generate vector tiles? And uh, do you see Richard's lightning talk that uh, earlier? Um, so for right now, my vector tiles, I'm using um, a different C++ program that's similar to Richard's. Um, but um, I think the approach that um, is taken by TileMaker um, is really interesting. Um, scaling that up, there's also projects such as Open Map Tiles that are more database oriented. Um, and for ProtoMaps.js, the goal is to be an open source front end that's compatible um, with any back end or any um, tile source. Um, that uses sort of the standard MBT tile format that's supported in things like PostGIS. Uh, great, we still have so many questions lined up, so we'll just go through them so fast. Uh, the other question is, is it possible to combine speedy WebGL feature rendering with higher quality canvas-based text rendering? I think it's possible, um, and that's what Tangram does. Uh, but it's very challenging uh, for technical reasons because um, of the way, for example, um, web workers work. Um, you can't access uh, Canvas in a web worker, so you have to do things on the main thread, move it to a GPU texture, and then move that you know into um, your WebGL sort of um, view. Uh, so there's uh, like kind of like sophisticated technical reasons why a lot of these renderers end up being slow if they choose Canvas. Mm, okay. uh, the next question is, is there a way to combine ProtoMaps, JS, and OpenLayers? Uh, that's uh, something I'm looking into right now, uh, which is um, if ProtoMaps.js can just be like any other uh, raster tile layer um, inside OpenLayers. I think that might be um, a more high performance approach uh, than the current vector rendering mode that's inside open layers. I'm not an open layers expert, so if you're willing to uh, provide input on um, on this part of the project, um, I'd be happy to talk. Oh, great. Um, on your ProtoMaps label demo that you've done, uh, are there trade-offs that you have had to make in the in the demo? Uh, yes, um, it's all, um, you know, it's just compromise on top of compromise because if you're doing everything in the browser, especially with only a single thread and no web workers, um, you have to make a lot of choices because you only have one frame of time to render everything. So you have to do things like label layout can only be access aligned bounding boxes instead of more sophisticated polygons. Um, and all the code is open source and on GitHub. So if you're interested, you can look it over and um, Feel free to email me with questions um, about how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, there's also another question. Uh, are there plans to improve such indexing for OSM? I'm not sure if that's related to map rendering, um, but um, you should check out the Nominatum project, um, as well as projects such as Peleus and Photon, which are geocoders. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, the last question. Uh, could you please add the language code uh, to your demo? Um, I'd be happy to add um, any language code. Um, I'm especially interested in languages that um, are um, sort of like non-official, but have a lot of community interest. Um, a lot, like a lot of the times are not supported by the government, for example. Um, but I think um, adding more languages, especially these um, you know, less used ones, um, is a really compelling uh, sort of possibility for OSM. So please um, uh, do things like open a pull request um, or um, send me a request for adding languages to the demo. Um, and I'd be happy to, yeah, so I'd be happy to add them. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Uh, that's the end of our questions. And uh, thank you so much, Brandon, for an amazing interacting, interactive talk. Uh, for more interactions with Brandon, uh, please, uh, you can join him in the post-shock chat room. And that marks the end of our talk.